today, running and managing your own business could be a little bit like a roller coaster. One day you're a star, the next day nobody wants to talk to you. PR is used far more for preventing harmful activities than it is for promoting it. What is PR in 2024? Bill Gates famously said if he had, was down to his last dollars of uh, marketing <laughs> spend, he'd spend it on PR. What would be my PR tactics to attract investors Hi guys, welcome to my new episode, Brands Through Stories. I'd like to thank you for subscribing to our channel, for leaving your comments, for giving us your likes. The channel is growing and it's all because of your support. Please enjoy today's episode. Today, running and managing your own business could be a little bit like a roller coaster. One day you're a star, the next day because of the cancel culture, nobody wants to talk to you. So you might love PR or you might hate it, but you cannot ignore it anymore. PR has become for sure one of the essential tools for us business owners for, to survive, to, create our, to make our company successful. And I have to confess, I've neglected PR for a long time for 20 years. And I tried a little bit, you know, maybe about five years ago, I felt it was expensive. I felt there were no results. But today I realize I probably, I had to pay more attention to the PR. And in the era of AI, technological revolution, social media, we cannot simply ignore it anymore. And I've heard this interesting story or a phrase that says, if you don't tell your story, then somebody else will, and you might not like it. So my first step today to start on this whole journey of PR for my company is to create this episode. I want this episode to be a playbook for those like me who ignored it or didn't take it seriously for quite some time. So this episode is with my guest to develop a playbook for 2024 with a focus on the Middle East, the companies that are in this region, because it has some its own cultural nuances. Out of my whole network, the best person to write this playbook with us is my guest today. So please welcome Alistair Crichton. He's a true professional, PR and journalism. He has more than two decades of experience in this region, right? He worked on the top companies that a lot of people probably dreamed about to even uh, be in touch with, like Adnog, Mazdar, Abu Dhabi Culture, right? Center for Culture and Tourism and so on. So a true, true professional. Please. Oh, thank you so much, Alistair. <laughs> thank you, Nina, for having me on this podcast. It's a truly fascinating uh, journey that you've been on with this podcast. It's in, in, uh, I've been looking at many of the episodes, and it's really uh, um, been very interesting stuff that looks at all different aspects of uh, branding and communications, and it's, uh, it's an honor to be on this with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so have you heard about the uh, you know, business people like me who for 20 years running successful companies, sometimes successful, sometimes it's all kinds of, you know, uh, times, but and then completely ignoring PR side. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's very common. Uh, it's a, a lot of what uh, the PR industry uh, has to do, and it makes it a public relations to give full name. Uh, we talk a lot about having to educate uh, the population, educate businesses about public relations and what it is. And that might seem quite odd. You know, if we've been, if this industry is, you know, it, it, it's one of the newer uh, communications industries in some ways, maybe 100 years ago, 110 years ago, I guess, would have been the, the, the origins of it, uh, really came into its own own probably with the birth of consumerism, uh, much like advertising, which exploded at the same time. There's different fields of PR that looks at different things. But yes, it's, it's been very, very difficult to really pin down what it is. And I have to confess, whilst the industry says it wants to do this education, I think it's also quite happy with it being a little bit mysterious. And I think we quite like our dark arts, um, you know, the, 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 that, 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 
a description that's been given to PR over the years that it's that it's something mysterious about it and there's something that people don't really understand but actually it's it is relatively straightforward so what is, uh, if we could define PR today, what is PR in 2024? Well, you're obviously got a strong back branding background. And I think that you're aware that even with, with branding, it can be quite difficult to explain to members of the public or even businesses exactly what branding is and what it encompasses. But for, but but uh, I'm sure that a lot of uh, a lot of listeners to the, 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 the show will be kind of aware that branding is a lot more than a logo, for instance. But what, you know, so I'd say if the essence of branding is the development of a, uh, of of reputations and creating the, the the foundations of a strong reputation for a company, then a lot of what PR does is is work with 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 that initial work you've done and to uh, to enhance and p- protect those reputations. And uh, oftentimes, the, when when PR is more in the press or when you hear about us more, is uh, when you're really protecting or rebuilding those reputations in the event of a crisis, in the event of something that's happened that uh, is damaging to your reputation. And that's the really that's when PR is can can be really seen to be in action. That's when we move in and really help to protect the company to ensure that it can uh, overcome whatever issue or crisis it's facing and come out of the other side, you know, with its reputation, if not quite intact, then at least with a way forward and with a, a direction that can uh, maintain the maintain that reputation, maintain the company's uh, integrity. So that's mm-hmm. really the core thing of what we do. In that sense of when you will see PR in action, crisis work, the, the 95% of our work isn't crisis. It's much more uh, on the basis of like, you know, trying to formulate what that company really is, how it interacts with its audience, what its uh, audiences should be and whether it's speaking to them the right way. I think a very simple way of putting yeah. it, it would be like telling the right story to the right people through the right channels. That's okay. PR in a That's nutshell. PR. And it's it was hundred years ago that and it's still the right it's still this definition would be relevant for yes. today. It's yeah. just the channels, I would guess, and stories. Channels change. PR has been going a lot longer than hundred years yeah. ago. It was codified hundred years yeah. ago, I would say. Ah, right. um, okay. but but you know, people wanting to get their message across has been uh, has been a universal part of yeah. history. What's that a great line? You know, history is told by the victors, history is told by the winners. Well, that's the that's that that would be the the, the PR scribes of old would have been the people who were helping like divide, you know, dictate the history as it happened at the time. So that's where PR has always existed. It's just been codified, you know, more recently. Yeah. Right. Okay. Perfect. That's, um, that's great. So if I were to just apply it to my, uh, my industry, so branding is that foundation for reputation. And then, because I always say brand is, uh, if brand didn't exist, the word brand, then I would use the word reputation for it. And PR is guarding, safeguarding that reputation, right? Yes. I think in the agency models that were developed over the last, uh, I'd say, 50 years, 40 years, uh, where we were looking at uh, these these giant uh, communications networks that encompassed marketing, advertising, PR, and branding, um, I've always felt that PR and branding sits together very comfortably. Mm-hmm. And as, a, as an independent now operating outside of the big agencies, it is definitely towards branding that I gravitate because I think that we speak very much the same language. And I think with advertising, we don't necessarily, we're not, um, advertising and marketing are are very much in the business of selling product, I would say. And they can do it with a a degree of creativity and a degree of... uh, interesting ways of approaching that you know going way way beyond just a just just very simple sales strategies but branding you and i we're much and pr we're much more interested in that reputation more esoteric concepts more uh the more conceptual approach to a company um i think where where we differ is branding seems to move in at a certain phase like at the launch of a company or at a rebrand phase when there's a change happening and you're very heavily involved in that and then and then you disappear Mm. You're not part of a continual process. We sort of take over after that. Mm. So I really like working with branding um, branding agencies in in creating a sort of like new approach to uh, to a communication structure that involves branding a little bit more and you know looks at how we can uh, merge our our equal strengths. Right. Great. Let's take it step the step back 
And let's make it, break it very simple for entrepreneurs. So let's get rid of all the uh, uh, terminologies, branding, PR, and just make it very simple. Because I understand all the theory, like mm -hmm. I said, but when it comes to practicing it uh, for my own businesses, I tried it. Yep. We hired the agency. It wasn't recently. It was about five years ago. Okay. And then it, I felt it was a nightmare. First of all, I always felt it was expensive. I couldn't judge the... Um, I mean, I might sound very amateurish now. <laughs> it might influence my career as a brand strategist. But I felt like I couldn't judge the results. Yep. Like, okay, so they've posted, they did this three press releases, and then what? What is the result? So it was always this kind of, I to do it, not to do it. Is it expensive? Is this the right way to do it? Then I could, I always felt like that maybe they don't understand what we're saying. And so I just left it, mm. right? Is this something that many of us do, or it's just me being so ignorant? Yeah, no, it's not ignorance at all. It's, this is very common. And it's it's really one of the very difficult aspects of PR to try and explain is what are the, uh, how do you measure success? Yeah. How do you show results? Um, and I think what's really important when I approach uh, or a client or a client, a potential client or a client approaches me, is the very first step is to outline what does success look like? All oh, right. Uh, what yeah. are the results we're looking for and that needs to be super clear because otherwise you're going to you, you're not necessarily going to understand now this leads into some issues especially in this part of the world where a lot of the more established uh, firms will have quite strong ideas of PR from back in the day and they look at press releases they look yeah. at print coverage you know fine 15 years ago 18 years ago sorry when I 18 years ago I arrived in the, in, in the in the UAE and we used to measure the success of newspapers by weighing them Gulf News used to weigh in at 2.7 kilograms on a weekend because of the sheer amount of advertising. There was not enough printing capacity in the Middle East to print any extra copies of Gulf News, Kalish Times, those newspapers. When the National set up, they had to build an entirely new printing press because there just simply wasn't any capacity. Nowadays, most newspapers don't have daily print editions. You know, yeah. the, 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 it, the difference is so huge. And of course, back then, your column inches, as we used to measure a story in a newspaper, would be a very powerful metric to show people of the, the success we're doing. That still hangs on. And it's, it's frustrating for professionals because we know that, you know, somebody's demanding we get, a, you know, a story in, in one of the local newspapers. And we're explaining, but is your audience really reading that? You're going for a, a, a demographic of 15 to 21. They haven't read a newspaper in their lives. So <laughs> those demographic, those metrics are very difficult. So there's a lot of new approaches. I'm not going to go into the complexity of it, but it's something that I work with a lot is looking at new approaches to metric and new approaches to KPI. So the first thing I would do with a new client is establish what those KPIs and metrics are going to look like. What does success look like? Um, that can then the other thing that I think is really important to explain what we do is I will ask you, you know, what is your story and how are you going to tell it? And, you know, that's, that's then my job is formulating what your story should be, how it's going to, um, have all the right beats and all the right story moments and all the right different bits of explaining, you know, what is the tension you're overcoming? What is the context in which you exist? What are the calls to action you're going to get? All of those things are things that I work out very, very early on with the client. And I've been very successful in convincing clients who have never really seen the need for PR or comms um, that it's as integral to their business as uh, as their as their business strategy, that the business strategy is is nothing without the comm strategy. Right. So if I may ask you a, a little bit more about the success, right? So defining your success, I understand there could be different kind of KPIs. But for, let's say, a new business just moved to Dubai or startups, right? Yeah. So big, th big hub for startups. Yes. What could be, I don't know, three points that define their success when it comes before when they start formulating the PR strategy? Okay. So one of those would be how successfully is the story being told? And that could mm -hmm. be through message penetration. So that, and that would then be looking at uh, doing surveys of the, of the audience, you know, six months or however long uh -huh. into a campaign to see how well that campaign is being received. Are people understanding your values? Are they understanding the messages you're saying? Are they getting through? So 
that would be one of the most right. important ones. That's much more important, I think, than uh, than um, than the the, the old old fashioned newspaper Number. metric. The newspaper yeah. metric is a show. I'm showing you what uh, that yeah. we've done this. Looking at message penetration is telling you that it's worked. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very important. Um, another one, of course, it does come down to it. This is communications exists for a reason, but it's sales. So we could look at whether but it's, mm. it's slightly harder to demonstrate that PR has been directly responsible for sales. But if you don't, for instance, have a mainstream advertising campaign going, then, then PR is is going to be the, the the one channel you've utilized. So of course it would be dependent on that. Right. And I'm quite good at convincing people to up their spend on PR and less on advertising because I'm I, I think it's a, a far more effective um, effective way of getting true messages, real messages out there. I think it's actually Bill Gates famously said if he had was down to his last thousand dollars of uh, marketing yeah. spend, he'd spend it on PR. Yeah, yeah. So and I think he's doing that very well. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. I think it was uh, uh, when I was preparing for for our podcast. I've like it opened new, of course, new world for me of PR. I always knew, but to that extent. And I think it was Richard Branson who said that he believes that PR, the good story, is much stronger, right? The PR, a good PR, is so much stronger than the front page advertising. Yeah, it's exactly what. Yeah. PR is the stuff that stays with you forever. forever. Um, advertising uh -huh. is quite short term. I mean, I think let's look at one of the, the great Dubai examples back in the day. Um, we don't see that many PR stunts anymore, but an effective PR stunt. That's the that's the sort of like the, the holy grail of what we want to do as PR practitioners is have a client who wants something major that's going to have such a big impact. Um, and that one was, of course, Andrea Gassi playing tennis mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the helicopter. Had at oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. at Burj Al Arab. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. That put uh, that put Dubai on the map. I mean, like that was every aspect of that was very, very clever. And that comes more from a PR background than a, than an advertising background. That's one of those ones where there is a, a little bit of a, a link up, but uh, the, but that's that's creative PR and process. Um, I think some of the older PR stunt examples I can think of are probably a bit not PC anymore. But one of the very first ones was uh, um, was it was uh, Edward Bernays. The, the father of PR, who uh, was given the task of convincing women to smoke when women didn't smoke, and managed to. I don't to... know if we're gonna ban the our show episode will be banned because of even the... it's a long now time it's not it's even a long time ago. <laughs> but these are the kind of things that said that sometimes that would be looked at. It was very successful, huh? yeah. Seems like <laughs> from from about two percent of the population to forty percent of the population, very successful. How sad. And now we're doing the other way around. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's come full circle in that way. And the fact that uh, PR is m used far more for uh, for preventing harmful activities than it is for promoting it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I'm 100% convinced now PR is the case. Before you start, define your success. Absolutely. Now, the next big question. I don't have money. <laughs> We have money for sales. That's the typical, you know, startups or we have money for sales. We have money for new websites, but well, PR, there's no money. Well, what on earth are the salespeople going to work with? Yeah. What are they selling? I mean, if they don't, if you don't have the the PR aspect of things, if you don't have your messages, if you don't have what your the ability to write a decent sales brochure or write a sales tag, those are the tactical aspects of PR that are absolutely critical. I mean, I come from a writing background, journalism background, and a writing background. So the power of messages is is super important, and messages is 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 the bread and butter of PR. The message is, you know. The, the simple ways of what you are saying, um, they can be very, very simple and they should be very simple and you want to keep them to a minimum. Uh, but it is, it is that uh, aspect of, uh, of, the, of the, the communication structure, the, the basics of what you're saying, well, that's PR. And then how are you going to say it? Um, and that means, do you have a spokesperson? Do you, if, if, if you're a founder of a startup, then you're probably quite likely to be somebody who wants to, uh, maybe wants to be in the limelight a bit, maybe wants to represent the company, maybe as the, the personification of, of the brand and the brand values. But do you know how to do that? And do you know how to really, you know, formulate that correctly? And that's PR. Um, are you comfortable speaking to the media? Probably not. Most people People are terrified of public speaking and imagine public speaking when the person is going to be potentially actively hostile. Well, you need training. That's mm -hmm. PR. 
Mm -hmm. um, so all those as tactical aspects then come into play. And that's the really important stuff that I think is far more important in the early days than, than an advert. Um, you know, an article on the founder and his great idea or her great idea that's coming out in a, in a, in a respected publication because, you know, something that you know is going to hit that target audience, that's far, far more valuable than, uh, than, 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 than your, your, your standard banner ads or even, mm. you know, display print ads in this day and age. Right. Since you've mentioned writing, the whole idea of this AI and chat GPT, I've seen some writing, but I, I, I've realized a lot of people became writers these days, have you noticed? <laughs> well, they didn't, but they think they did. <laughs> yeah, they think they, they're writers. And then the some of the brochure copies or website copies, what is your take on that? What is... But I think that uh, I think chat GPT is already causing um, a lot of trauma amongst the freelance writing community. Uh, I can be a little bit more cynical on this uh -huh. in the fact that I think that and I know for a fact that good writers are thriving mm -hmm. and a lot of poor writers are going out of business. Uh, I think ChatGPT does a very good job at writing generic and boring corporate copy. Um, it does it very well. It's almost like it was made for that. Uh, that stuff that was time consuming. And of course, you know, and it became, it's, it's become the fact that this is almost a ubiquitous way of writing amongst, uh, corporations to the extent that it's almost a joke. It's just this yeah. boring, dry way. Now that that's becoming so common and everything, good writing's needed more than ever and good writers will thrive. So... Yeah. That's one of the one of those weird like negatives and positives. Everything that yeah. I look at with the uh, chat GPT and AI has a negative component and a potential positive yeah. component. But that one, I think good writers will thrive. Um, and I've, I'm seeing it already. I'm seeing writing writer friends of mine are getting busier. Uh, the good ones. And if I may add from my own experience, we have difficulties now with the writers. It's I think in recent like literally one month. I, I don't want to offend anyone, but about like at least five, I think, copywriters. It's just absolutely, it was a difficult, difficult task because everyone by default go to chat GPT now. I'm sure they were okay before this thing existed. I'm sure they knew how to write. But now they, you give them a task, they write it. The minute they start working, they go by default to chat GPT and all the text became, become the same. And we have difficulties in finding writers now. Difficulties. But, yeah. Well, there are good writers out there and they, they do exist. Um, but you have to make sure that I mean, one, of the, one of the issues is we're still in that stage where I think clients are a little bit too happy with chat GPT at the moment and happy with the really? content they're getting because it ticks their corporate boxes. It's, mm. it's not going to be, um, it's not, it's not going to be difficult. It's not, the language is going to be, is going to fit within the simplistic categories that they want, which is a good thing, by the way. I mean, you know, we, we want our language to be easily relatable, but it becomes bland and it becomes boring and it becomes anodyne. That existed before. This chat GPT has just made it much easier to write bland, boring copy. Yeah. Uh, so I think exciting copy is going to come back a bit, but you must see this in in branding. Um, mm -hmm. and I know that obviously branding is, is so much more than the graphical aspects of, of, of what you do, but you must see because these uh, these these logos are being generated by chat GPT. They're being lo generated by the all sorts of AI things and they just look awful, no? Yeah, yeah, they generate about 100 options and they, they don't know which one to choose. And then the client takes it and shows to all their all his or her relatives and the relatives give opinion and then they end up with 100 options but confused mind. <laughs> so yeah. I'm very cool about this. I think I think it's actually a great tool. Uh, it costs about five dollars maybe per logo, where we charge at least we charge a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but we do three logos and people know exactly who they are and why they want this, yeah. or hundreds, and then they confuse for the rest of the year. But I had a different story also interesting with Chad GPT. I had a client that did everything. So they fit out their they did the fit out of their offers. They created the product, they launched the website, everything. And then I got a call from their CEO who said, Nina, and now we realize we're confused. We don't know who we are. <laughs> and I was like, okay, send me what you have. And then I see this copy completely generated from ChatGPT. 
like completely everything because you now you can guess sort of you know the certain phrases and yeah. and I'm reading and I'm confused who they are <laughs> so they go back to me to go back to them to explain who they are and this is I think typical scenarios now what's happening yeah, that doesn't sound unusual in the PR world mm -hmm. as well. I mean, we ha we have a lot of overlap in what we do for a, for an, for a company. Like you know, you you look at um, mission, vision, and values, purpose. We look at mission, vision, values, and purpose. You look at um, and, and then do you rewrite our vision and mission? Do well, we write it, the sometimes, one yeah. I mean, we we have we do face um, this can happen that uh, that the branding agency will have come in at the beginning and have come up with these great ideas and they'll be very strong and then you know four or five months down the line, especially with a start. Startup. A company can change. It can have it. Can have its. You know, pivots are, are are a natural part of a startup. And you know, having successful pivot points where where these this can be done happens all the time. And it's a natural part. It's a healthy part of that process. But it can leave your initial branding behind. And then we come in doing the PR maybe a couple of months later. Look at their initial branding work. And think well, that, these values don't work anymore. So we'll have to work on that. So right. that's why I think that uh, PR and branding are should be linked. They should be. They they should yeah. be. We should work together on on every step of the way i really do think so um but yeah that's just 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 an aspect of how that can happen again going back to uh chat gpt and ai it's uh it really is transforming the industry at, at a at an incredibly rapid pace uh i think trying to think who it's affecting the most. I think because, you know, you have these massive big agencies these days, these huge conglomerations. In fact, I worked for two of the bigger agencies in the Middle East, which was uh, Asda Burson Marstello, which became Asda BCW, and then laterally Hill and Knowlton. But then BCW and, or Burson Colin Wolf, yeah, BCW and H&K have now merged to create another mega. And now uh, the bigger one. An even yeah, bigger yeah, yeah, one, yeah. yeah. And this just gets, uh, they're, they're very <laughs> unwieldy by this stage. So are they implementing challenges? GPT correctly at the moment? Do they have the policies in place? How quickly can they get those policies in place? You know what big organizations are like. You know, they've moved, yeah. they've moved, tend to move quite slowly. Yeah. Whereas myself, I have actually, I, I'm, I, I work with a select group of uh, similar consultancies, but I am essentially a, a consultant. Um, but I'm allowed to be that consultant by utilizing chat GPT and my functionality. Mm -hmm. I don't require an account executive at this stage because a lot of that uh, work that that hard grind i'm i can i can get that from uh, from chat gpt um a lot of the admin work i have i got admin down to a fine art with chat gpt a while ago i mean i find it brilliant for some of those things um, and it leaves me free to concentrate on, on 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 higher stuff i predict a huge problem with this down the line I would, I should have account executives and account managers, and I should be mentoring them, and I should be training them. And they're going to be the next generation of account directors and senior directors, and you know the the senior senior uh, guys within within the PR industry. If they're not getting that mentorship, and they're not, what's going to happen to the industry? And I really see this as being the, probably the biggest problem that uh, that AI is going to be, going to be creating for the industry in the medium term is what are people learning and where are the mentors and where are the tutors? Is that something you think could be a problem within your industry? I I, com I think our industry is, com is completely being redefined. It's changing dramatically. And I see people that could completely ignore all the AI and its opportunities. I see people who are completely embraced AI and do now doing things that are not even authentic anymore. And there are people like me who are just there in the middle, don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did the, um, ta uh, I asked my team to put all the AI tools that exist, not that exist, that, you know, we could find and see what we could start implementing and testing. They gave me this extensive Excel document with everything what's possible i opened it i thought oh my god i wish on one hand is exciting on the other hand is oh my god this is scary it's scary i don't even know where to start right it's so many different things that we could do it's being redefined uh i my attitude towards it well the world is not stable world is always changing so let's do that it's new challenge yeah but one thing relationship right i think between agency and clients, something that cannot be taken away is the relationship with people. That at the end of the day, the owner of the company would call you and say, 
What do you think, Nina? What do you think, Alistair? Yeah, well, as as somebody who came from a journalism background and and started at the, uh, at the in the PR industry is very much as as a worker bee, as a writer, as uh, as a strategist, but as as somebody who really does the the you know is at the coalface doing the doing the heavy lifting on on PR strategies and PR delivery and uh, and content and all those things. I came to client relationship a little bit later, and of course, you're absolutely right. That is. That's 95% of our business really is maintaining, finding, maintaining those client relations. Um, and the, the work gets done. How it gets done is, I wouldn't say it's irrelevant. Um, it's far from irrelevant, but it's not what the clients, the clients just going to be wanting to see good work. They're not going to care about what's going on under the hood, are they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. still so I'm still very but I, I, I find the the, the, the the pace of change fascinating. I've been through the pace of change a few times in a previous career. I started in journalism when I was very young, at the age of eighteen. And I actually experienced in a couple of newspapers um the the the, 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 the last days of hot metal press. You know, when things were still being done on, on like, you know, yeah, actual uh, physical bits of metal being put into rows to create uh -huh. type. You know, I, I experienced that. Um, I was there for when, you know, before uh, the Internet was used in newsrooms uh, widely. I mean, we would check everything using Encyclopedia Britannica's. We would uh, fact check everything through dictionaries and thesauruses and through all these reference titles. I had a Debrett's next to me, so I would check people's names of, uh, of, of, of famous or famous or well-known politicians or aristocrats or celebrities in the UK, we would check against these reference books. So, you know, it the It excites change... me listening to these stories. <laughs> I, I'm like, I feel the age now, my, my age, because I'm... these stories excite me. I can't be that old. I'm thinking I cannot be that old. But yeah, I do remember that. I mean, I worked in one place, I remember, when we used to edit using red pen on typewriters. Seriously. <laughs> But you see, and then computers and then internet and yeah. everything. And now it's just a new state. But I cannot, um, I think AI is powerful. This is a tool where you can directly get to know what your customers think. Can you? I think it's much more than we, ha we could do before. Before we used to depend on the research agencies yeah. and their person asking questions somewhere in the shopping center, mm. right? And his mood... The way he asks questions, his personality. Now is a lot of stories, a lot of things and insights we can get out of the uh, it's, using AI yeah. tools. It's replacing uh, Google in terms of uh, desk research. Um, I think that's down to the fact that Google's functionality as a, as a good research tool has faltered uh, as its commercial. Uh, imperatives got stronger and stronger um its actual usability has fallen off there's a there's a there's a whole uh there's a whole you know field of study based on on how our mainstay uh internet tools have have become worse and worse over the years so chat gpt has come along at the right time to replace that but of course it's still far far from perfect it is not a mission critical application you cannot trust the information it provides you have to double check um it's that some aspects of that is getting worse uh so whilst it's a very very useful tool in some aspects i think that person in the mall that you know even you know, even in a bad mood, is still going to be a very important person. And I'm seeing traditional market research. I still love traditional market research. I still think you can't beat numbers. You can't beat speaking to real people. I'm more referring to not maybe chat GPT, but other AI tools where you know the uh, where you can check the customer sentiment and you can you know see what activities are happening on the website and so on. This, more of the more data from the social media yeah. capturing things like that rather than chat gpt i mean that 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 field is uh is just crazy and the, yeah what yeah. The ai allows us to do in analyzing large data, data blocks yeah. is is yeah. quite something i mean some of that's existed for a while but now the fact that it's at, it's at our fingertips you know i used to have to go to a specialist agency for some of this now i can use a prompt and um that's one of my skills with a prompting i i, I spend a oh, lot really? of time working out how to use <laughs> chat gpt and I, my, my prompts can be four or five pages long 
Uh, because one thing with the uh, chat GPT, oh you know, if you if it doesn't come up with something good, and if you've got some issues with it that need to be corrected, it's very bad at correcting itself. Yeah. So it's like very it starts, very bad yeah. at saying, okay, I like this, you're ninety percent there, but let's work on this ten percent. No, then you're going to get down to thirty percent in in three or four different prompts, and you're going to be like frustrated and you lose lose the plot. You have to get it right pretty early. It's uh, that will improve as the functionality, or or will it improve? There's also this thing about you know what data set is it being modeled on and initially the data set was real stuff on the internet created by you know all of us and now it's increasingly looking at stuff that was created by ai so you know yeah it's yeah. chasing its tail a little bit and that's a little bit of a worry but those are these are uh, very much early days still i mean we've gone from nobody really knowing or utilizing ai a couple of years ago to it being like you know I've known people who have lost their jobs over it already. Already? So, yeah. That's very sad. Going back to PR and the uh, chess... Uh, <laughs> it's all PR. It's all PR. Going back a little bit to help in creating this playbook. Hmm. So so I want to attract investors. Yeah, yeah, I'm a business owner. I think I've done a great, great product. I've done my branding sorted, sort of. I have a logo. I have values, vision, mission on the wall. I know I define who I am. I want investors. How could PR and what could I do? What would be my PR tactics to attract those investors or to convince them yeah. to invest in me? Well, this is something that I think about a lot because I've, I'm working a lot with startups, and that's my that's my favorite field at the moment. Is uh, is is you know when you, when you, when you've got that big wide canvas you can work with, and having worked with very established, um, very entrenched, uh, very large uh, firms in the UAE and multinationals in Saudi Arabia for so many years, it's very refreshing being able to go in where you can. You know, you can you can start with a blank sheet. And one thing I do with almost every uh, company is, I think it's, I think it's very easy to understand that we'll have a B two B component of any strategy. We're looking at how do we operate within our within our business sphere. You know, how do we operate within those stakeholders who are either, either suppliers or potential partners or or those you know that 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 field. And then of course business to consumer, you know, the customers getting out there into a wider field if, the, if it's the kind of company that's going to be consumer focused. So there will normally be those two components, a very common part. I almost always add a B2I, business to investor component, um, because I think it's so important that I think startups are obviously thinking about, they need to think about their um, their end game, their exit strategies, their next steps, their phasing. Um, so I build that in from the start. And the tactics will vary from company to company, but there are obviously basics. And it's looking at who, who, like the, you know, stakeholder mapping. Who are your stakeholders, and what do you, what do they expect from you, and what do you expect from them? One other aspect is how much can you influence your stakeholders. So, you know, if you've got a lot of influence, if you're um, likely to have like a lot of influence over, say, an, a potential investor, you're trying to get them to do something, invest in you. That means that you've got to really focus quite a lot on them. You've got to put a lot of effort into that, into that relationship, because you can change that relationship. Now, if you're looking at a major stakeholder, it might be a UAE regulator. You have no power over the regulator. Yeah. As a startup, you probably have on zero power over. So you don't actually have to focus on that regulator. That's not a stakeholder you have to communicate to or from above and beyond the basics. So it's then so working out which of your stakeholders you really, really need to uh, apply your efforts to. It's very important. And investment, inve potential investors generally sit quite high up in that for me. That's mm -hmm. normally one of the ones where we really want to be focusing. So how would that work? Well, you know, organizing face-to-face -face meetings, uh, making mm -hmm. sure that when you have the face-to-face -face meetings, you have the collateral to go with it. So we're looking at things like um, investment brochures. Uh, something that's very important is ensuring that your communication strategies and your business strategies and everything associated with, with, uh, with your business is based on evidence. 
Mm-hmm. So that means based on research. It's mm-hmm. based on a really strong understanding of your audience segments. It's based on, it show that you've done the homework and demonstrate that. So that could be a couple of slides which show, you know, these are key findings. Mm-hmm. And an appendix, I love an appendix to be about, you know, a couple of hundred pages thick of all the actual hard work that's been done to come to those insights. So that's the kind of kind of thing that I think every uh, strong investor-related comm strategy should have. It should be investor-related. It should be... Uh, articulate, it should be to the point, and it should be a, a very, very clear um, explanation of, you know, it should be able to be the kind of presentation, the kind of approach and the kind of messages or the messages that allow an investor to make a very quick decision. Right. Now, in terms of the investors in the GCC, how different do you have, what do you think, how different they are from, let's say, Europe, America? And also, is there any different you know, is there any specific PR tactics that they require or they're quite dissimilar? My field investment has basically been in the Middle East, so I can't really talk to uh, to, to Europe um, mm-hmm. in that way. But I do know that uh, investors who are based out of the, the main investment hubs, like, uh, you know, the offshore hubs like AD, um, Abu Dhabi Global Market, yeah, ADGM yeah. or DIFC or those places, they will have fairly uh, a fairly standard approach. They're not going to be, they're, they're, they'll be looking at best practices, surely. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're aiming for a best practice. Now, in terms of uh, what you really want to demonstrate here, it's very much local knowledge. So that mm. you know the local marketplace, you know the local nuances, you know cultural sensitivities, you know that the product is not going to be um, causing, you know, that, that, it's not, that, it's, that it's culturally relevant and not culturally insensitive. I mean, this has happened. This has cropped up. I mean, I, I seem to remember, you know, um, Hooters wanted to open up in the Middle East at one point. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, that was a that was a remarkable. You know, they 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 they've had press releases and everything. They were putting out. Yeah, that's really not going to fly around here. Um, yeah. So those aspects of like, you know, having the, the knowing the, the local markets, but it's also down to the nuances of knowing what channels. I mean, I can't remember at the top of my head, but, you know, I know that uh, certain, it also changes so rapidly, but, but some countries prefer some social media channels. I think Facebook was very big in Saudi, but it wasn't quite so big in Kuwait. WhatsApp is, is used very, very strongly by youth across the Gulf. Um, I think uh, Snapchat is still very popular popular in some markets in Saudi, Saudi, whereas it's not popular in other markets. So it's having that kind of knowledge is really, really important to be able to demonstrate to an investor that, uh, that, that you as a company know this. And of course, who's told you as a company that this is the case? Your PR firm has. So we are very, very important in that, uh, in that role. What about, yeah, um, that's my favorite topic, um, awards. Awards. You know, I have a You've feeling that this place is all about awards. <laughs> everyone, it's like everyone is an award-winning company around me. I have my own view on awards. I'm very um, cynical. Okay, let's skeptical. hear Skeptical. Your... Why? Why can I ask you? What's, why, why are you cynical and skeptical about awards? I've done enough talking. Let's let's let's, see, let's hear from the host. Forgive me, all the awards organizers. I don't believe in them anymore. And I had recent experience, which I don't want to mention the name of the award, but it really proved me that you know, it was the first time in my life I actually, because of my team, they've convinced me that, to, you know, you need an award after 20 years here. You need an award because that's what people are looking for. That's this measure of success for them. And I did it and we applied and we were shortlisted and so on. But the whole experience, everything... I felt it was, it just, I felt everything is all about money. (laughs) I felt it wasn't authentic. It wasn't real. And though I had very good results, shortlist and everything, but I I just, I, that was the last drop in my. (laughs) Well, it's called the awards industry for a reason. It's Uh an industry. You're right. It's about money. Uh, But there are ways (laughs) of doing it. And there are the right ways and wrong ways and a lot of ways kind of in between. And you've got to navigate that quite carefully. Um, I mean, 
I'd say that uh, thinking about the Middle East, the, the, our, our region as being somewhere unique in this, no, this is this is a universal thing. I, oh, I, a long time ago, yeah. long, long, long time ago, I freelanced for a publication about the awards industry. It was great because they used to pay me quite a lot of money for like these three or four thousand word articles that I could churn out in no time and just like, relax for the rest of the week. Oh, those were the days. Um, the decline of print uh, print publications is very sad for me. Um, but in terms of here, I, I'm very familiar with the awards, uh, how awards are structured here, because I used to uh, help organize them when I was a publisher at uh, one of the big publishers here, and some of the better known ones, actually. And on the other side, I've been on the team that has won uh, Middle East Campaign of the Year a couple of years running as, as one of the leads on that team, and many, many, many other awards. And also at both agencies, large agencies that I worked with, I was very much responsible for uh, crafting award entries and uh, helping work on the awards strategy. So I see it from from different points of view. And one of the main points of view is your uh, your uh, team was actually very, very correct. I think that awards can be very, very useful for morale and team building. Mm -hmm. It helps you get a lot of different people, especially in a large agency, um, gets a lot of different people from different functions within the agency to work together on a single, um, a single project. You know, if I'm putting together uh, something for a major award, I will need to be speaking to the guys from metrics. You know, what was the, what were the KPIs? How was this done? How, what was the results? I'll need to speak to the people who helped to work on the strategy. You know, what was the overall strategy and the goal? I'll need to speak to client relations uh, people to find out, you know, what was the, what did the client want from this? Were they happy with this? How did they express this? I'll need to speak to the, you know, what were the tactics that were used? So all of those things come into just one, you know, and I would be entering into 30 of these you know this was a this could be take, take up a lot of time um and that kind of like so that aspect of things was very very good for unity for creating some sort of unity and cohesion within the company and then of course there's the events the award ceremony itself which is normally you know, a large party at the end of the year where everyone gets quite lubricated has a lot of fun <laughs> and everyone gets on stage and cheers and everything like that and winning is is fun you know it's it's good to win these um it's, uh, it's it's really good to win these, uh, especially, you know, major awards, especially ones that are, are genuinely recognized within your peer group. So right. that's yeah. a really important thing. Make sure that they're the ones that are, that you're entering the ones that are really good for your peer recognition that, you know, if you win agency of the year, um, from uh, from I mean there's a, there's a number of different yeah. uh, I don't want to specify which particular yeah. ones but if you're if you're winning the agency of the year especially one of the international ones that's a really good feeling and that that really is something you can stick on your uh, um, your email signatures and on your websites and everything like that so of course that, in that case it's really really good. The grayer area ones, the ones that <laughs> sit in the middle, the, which are frequently a little bit of pay to play. Yeah. Um, there is generally going to be a component of competence involved, but they can be tied in a little bit. If you're looking at the publishing houses, I would make sure that you have had quite a strong relationship with those publishing houses before you enter their awards. Um, if you're then then there is then your level your playing field is going to be at least level with the people who have similar relationships if you don't have a relationship with that and you're entering then yeah i think it might be a bit of a i think you you it's you, you might not be getting shortlisted quite as often um i've got to be diplomatic about this yeah uh, but then there's there, there's other ones that are total pay to plays and you know working on big organizations here we would get requests in probably three or four a week and annoyingly we'd have to vet them and they're all you know the the, the triage should have just been throw these guys out we're never speaking to these guys but no a report would have to be written for each one and that honestly sapped a lot of time yeah. A lot of valuable time would be used in having to explain that some company coming out of uh, Portugal is wanting to nominate some CEO to be CEO of the year in a field that he's not even connected with. I think it's because my first business was conferences here 20 years ago, and that time there were no awards. 20 years ago, there was awards? No, yeah. what was the award? Oh, there was still some really good ones coming out there. Maybe international, but not local ones. Yeah. And I remember my uh, my business partners were telling me, Nina, let's enter the award wor award world. Money is there, <laughs> and we organize our own award. And how? And then they 
gave me the whole formula of how to do it, but oh, I've yeah. never done it. It wasn't really my thing. But I think you're absolutely right. You convinced me. Awards are important, and it's not just for the peer groups peer group but it's yes it's for your own team and clients Celebr- and, and clients. clients you can but you don't want to be you know you don't Absolutely. want to be going too much but you know but uh but clients yeah you'd, you'd like to be agency of the year you'd like to have yeah. done campaign of the year there's one other aspect though that is mm-hmm. quite interesting in our field and i would really love to get your feeling on this from branding um all is not all can be not quite what it seems advertising is very very famous for this uh, issue of scam adverts mm-hmm. in the middle east was extremely prevalent i'm not quite sure whether it's they've curbed it definitely from from the what i would say the high point or the low point depending on what you look at it but this would be like ultra creative adverts that are created specifically to win awards sometimes the brands involved didn't had no knowledge no. of them whatsoever right. occasionally they did and they would appear in like very unusual magazines like for two print runs um and but they would have nothing in connection with the the normal brand language or brand mm. identity they would often be extremely controversial and really mm. uh you know but basically they weren't real adverts so yeah, yeah, yeah that was a huge problem is that something that happens in in your field and branding I've only, uh, we haven't experienced it directly but i've seen the sort of ads and the award you know award-winning ads and i was always thinking how could the brand allow this they didn't they didn't <laughs> how could this even be allowed yeah. right i don't know i'm not into the hype once they've won, and, the brands can be a little bit more um, like, okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you away with it this time, but don't do it again. But it's it's part of the industry. But it is yeah. something that's a little bit, that's a, that's one of the cynical aspects. We have it a little bit in PR too. And I've got, again, I've got to be very diplomatic about this. But I'll see somebody uh, winning a, a gold um, award for a campaign for, you know, the, the PR for like one of the, a major global event, maybe a global sporting event or something like that. Something that was really everywhere and says, well, they won gold for this. Of course they did. Well, they won gold for sending out a couple of press release and handing out badges <laughs> to journalists. I mean, seriously, that one gets to me a little bit. That's a bit yeah. like, yeah, you're calling this a gold and your creative input was zero and you've literally put out a press release. It probably wasn't even written by the agency. It was probably, they probably just translated it and sent it around to a couple of uh, outlets here and then handed out some press badges. This is very uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, one, in terms of the, um, um, in terms of the, so awards are definitely important. Uh, I have to work on that more in They're, my head. I yeah, think they can be. They, 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 can they, they, be. They, they, there's a reason for them, and you can make them yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. Be doing again. What's your? This is my my number one thing. What are your goals? What are you trying yeah. to achieve? Yeah. So if you can set out what your category of success looks like from an award, which well, winning, but yeah. uh, beyond winning the award, what's it going to bring for you? What's the reason of doing it? Is it that internal cohesion? Is it that camaraderie? Do you want to have a, an event at the end of the year where you get all your people and you can go and hire a table and everyone has fun? You know, that's 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 something really important unto itself. Yeah. Yeah. What about just to, to to go back to the culture here? Is there anything? Is there are there cultural sensitivities that we need to really um, think about when we're drafting our PR strategy? Yes. <laughs> Could you please give us two or three that's super important? And the reason is we live here for so many years. We feel it. We know it's part of our culture. But the, there's a lot of new business people here, and what are the what are the um, red flags? I would say be careful about. Well, there's a lot, obviously. I mean, this is we we especially in Dubai when you're when you're based in Dubai and you're looking at a wider region. You've got to remember that um, that Dubai itself is still you know the 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 Middle East the UAE. I mean, they're, they're, these are conservative countries. So these are conservative um, societies. Uh, so there's a lot that. You forget because you're in Dubai and you you see that it's um you know it's it's glitz glamour it's an international destination that, that underneath there is still a lot of conservatism that you have to be careful with um, you have to be aware of I think careful sounds I think it's a lot of conservatism you have to be aware of and you have to be sensitive to and you have to respect. Um, 
And I think that once you start looking outside of Dubai, even within the UAE, that becomes even more pronounced. You know, you, Abu Dhabi is, a, is, is more conservative than Dubai. Sharjah is obviously more conservative than both. Uh, Fujairah is, is, is more conservative than, 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 than those three. Uh, so th those aspects have to be thought about. The other things is uh, understanding the cultural nuances of the different uh, groups that operate here. You know, like the Southeast Asians are, uh, make up the, the bulk of the population in Dubai. So, you know, are you, is, is your strategy um, worked out to, to, to incorporate that? Or are you living in your own bubble of like, if you're, if you're a Westerner like myself, are you living in a bubble of Westerners and you think that is the, the general attitude and that's what you're aiming towards? No, you're missing out 70, 80, 90% of your, uh, of, of your target audiences. So that, that idea that things aren't homogenized, they aren't inside of your uh, group. I think something that's really important here that people forget as well is that the markets are actually a lot more mature than people think when it comes to mm. communications. Mm. Um, you know, if you're thinking coming from branding, for instance, and I can say the same for PR, but if you're coming from branding and coming here and thinking that they're quite naive on branding or they don't mm. really understand branding, and yet you're looking at the fact that Dubai is one of the world's biggest brands. Brand, Emirates yeah. is a yeah. brand that is just, just staggering. Abu Dhabi has been doing huge work in promoting its own brand. Um, the work being done is, is at a very sophisticated level. It's on the global stage. Another thing we think of is... Um, understanding that there is a difference between uh, local and regional markets and international markets. Of course there is. But that the, that the, the countries, the businesses that operate here, and the, the governments, because we do a lot of government work here as well, they understand that difference. They know the nuances. They know the subtleties. They're, this is not, I mean, it's so many times uh, we've worked with people who have come in from, uh, from Asia or from the UK or and even from America thinking that this is, you know, I'm just really getting it wrong on how sophisticated it can be here. I'm yeah. really getting it wrong. Yeah, I've seen that so yeah. many times. I've noticed that also. I have this uh, couple of instances where the people say, oh, you know, I look at it, it's like in a village here. They don't know how to do design. They don't know how to... Yeah. I'm thinking... Yeah. Be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would be very careful with judging it like that on the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. sophisticated. Very sophisticated. You're looking at uh, coming from coming from London, you know. So yeah. yeah so you, and you're watching your football at the Emirates Stadium, are you? And uh, you know the yeah, level yeah, of the yeah. level of brand partnership, the level of sponsorship. Exactly. Um, no, this is different. This is a different league. You know, you, you guys haven't a clue when it comes to that, that kind of stuff. There is yeah. obviously other stuff that's a bit more. Uh, you know, the 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 media work is is very different here and it's it's genuinely more fun working in, with international media or working overseas with media because here it is true that the media is a little bit more compliant it's not uh, they have a certain you know it's relatively straightforward to speak to and get messages across through the media they're not going to fight back they're not going to argue quite the same way that they do elsewhere and that's um, something that you need to be aware of right right Oh, Alistair, I wish we had at least another three hours. Is that? Yes, it's up. Have we done an hour That's already? That's it. That's it. And we're only halfway. <laughs> no, it was Good such Lord. an insightful um, conversation. Thank you so much. I can't wait to start working on my PR strategy. The, through the whole episode, I'm thinking, what is my success measure? What do I need to do? How, who are my potential well, investors? Well, my and... rates are pretty reasonable. I mean, uh, operating <laughs> as a small boutique, and I do think that boutique is the future, by the way. I would mm -hmm. say that uh, with our ability to operate you know, at a, at a high level, working closely with uh, organizations and really addressing their needs, it's, it's, it's got, that's the way it's got to be done. But, you know, my rates are good. I'm, I'm happy to Thank you so much. We definitely. Help. We're going to leave your co uh, also your contacts um in the description of our podcast. Great. And thank you so much again. Thank you for finding time and all this invaluable information that you gave us. And Nina, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, be on your, uh, your excellent podcast. Thank you. Good. I think it was great. I think I've learned so much. I, I do so. this always. <laughs> the only thing we've missed is the quiz, but I think it's uh, we've covered so much. Anyway. I covered it out there. There was a yeah. couple of waffly bits, but I think in general no, it's okay. It's, it's, it's great. It's hard to articulate PR because it's it's really it's honestly part of our strategy is not to articulate it that well. We want to be a bit mysterious because we yeah. can shift from so many things. I, I'm in my life now going away from the word brand completely, and I think I I'm fine. Go away from PR. <laughs> <laughs>